We're going to look at centripetal acceleration. I'm going to show you two different ways to show that the centripetal acceleration is equal to V squared over R. That's the magnitude of the acceleration. I'm also going to show you a quick and easy way to find the direction of the centripetal acceleration. We're going to find that regardless of where we're looking at in our circle and an object going around in a circle, that the acceleration is always toward the center of the circle. So I'll show you two ways to do this problem. Let's get started. All right, I first want to consider an object that's going around in the circular path, and it's going to be going around in a counterclockwise direction, something like this. All right, next thing I'm going to consider is that I want to consider a couple different positions. So let's assume that the object starts over here, and I call this, he's at some position here, which I'm describing with the vector r initial. And then later on in time, he's going to be up at the top of the circle. I'll call this position rf. So during some amount of time, we call this delta t, he's actually gone through a little bit of angle here, right? We call this, say, the change in theta, right? His angle position changed. Now, let's have a look at what happens to the velocity. Now, and everything we're considering here is that the speed is constant. So if the speed is constant, it means that the magnitude of the velocity everywhere on this circle has to be the same. Okay, that's very, very important. Now, the direction can change, and that's kind of what these blue arrows are showing. So what we're going to do is that at my initial position, uh, the direction of the velocity is vi, and that's denoted over here. You can give it a little vector notation. And notice that it is perpendicular to that position vector, ri. Later on in time, after some, position, uh, after some time delta t, I've moved. I'm all the way at the top. And now my velocity here, I'll call this the final velocity. Notice that it's tangent to the curve and it's pointing to the left. So during that same time delta t, my velocity has changed. And that is really, really the key. Even though the speed is constant, okay, we have to remember that velocity changes because velocity has direction associated to it. Okay, so let me just write velocity is changing. Now, if you remember your definition of acceleration, the definition of acceleration is the change of velocity as a vector over the change in time. So this is the formula we're going to work with. And again, if you expand the top over here, a change of velocity is always a final value minus an initial value. And again, divided by change in time. All right, so let's work with our acceleration formula. We have two things to try to show. What is the magnitude? So we're interested in how big the acceleration is. So that means we would have to show, well, how big is this delta v vector and divided by delta t? Delta t is just the scalar. We don't have to worry about this one. Uh, so this is the first thing we need to show. Uh, the second thing we're interested in knowing is what is the direction, right? What is the direction of uh, this acceleration vector? And notice that uh, in the top, what we have is, if I'm looking for the direction of this vector, well, the direction of the vector A has to be the same as the direction of the vector delta V. Because all you're doing with the vector delta V is you're simply dividing it by another scalar. And if you divide a vector by a scalar over here, you're not changing the direction. Okay, so this is going to be very, very important. So the A direction is going to be equal to the direction of delta V. Okay, so this is going to be the second thing we're going to try to show here. So let's go ahead and kind of take some of this information from this figure and redraw it and see if we can find uh, what the magnitude is and what the direction is. Okay, so to look at the magnitude of the acceleration, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take some of those vectors here. Here's my initial position vector, ri. Here's my final position vector, rf. Um, again, I have the, the angle here. And one thing I could define is my displacement. If I started over here and I ended over here, my displacement vector is this one, right? This is the change in position vector, All right? So that's my displacement in this case. And that's going to be important. Now I could do the same thing for my velocity. Since velocity changes, I had uh, initial velocity, which was kind of in this direction here, called this vi. And I had final velocity, which was kind of pointing to the left. Uh, this is v final. And again, the angle here, you should be able to convince yourself that those have to be the same angles because both vectors are perpendicular to the position vectors. So we're going to define another really important vector, which is the one going from the initial velocity to the final velocity. 
this vector here must be the change of velocity. All right, if you understand both of these things, you should be able to see that what we have here are two isosceles triangles, all right? There's the first, uh, second one's over here. Since that angle is the same, right? This angle has to be the same. Uh, in addition, the magnitude of each of these sides is going to be a constant, right? Although we have this direction over here, what we have is if you're looking at just the length of that side, let's go ahead and just draw like this. This here has to be equal to V and this here has to be equal to V and they're separated by some angle. In addition, the magnitude of this vector should be the radius of the circle. And the magnitude of this one should also be the radius of the circle, which I've denoted by R. So this is actually really, really important. Now, since we have two similar triangles, just go ahead and just write that down, similar. That means that the ratio of some of those sides have to be the same, relating both of these isosceles triangles. So what you can do is you can write something like this. Uh, for example, the ratio of the opposite side, which I'm calling uh, the change in R, divided by any one of those sides, which is going to be a length R. This here must be equal to the change of velocity, at least the magnitude of it, and divided by the speed of the object, right? The length of any of those sides. You have to have this relationship right here. And this is really kind of the keystone to uh, proving what the magnitude of this centripetal acceleration is. Again, if I'm only looking for the magnitude, we are looking at equation one over here. Equation one will tell us that the magnitude of the acceleration equals delta V over delta T. So let's take this to the next page and finish off this proof. All right, so I'm first interested in the magnitude of A, which I have written here as my equation one. And I've, using the similar triangles, I've said that uh, both of these ratios must be the same since that angle uh, change in theta is the same. All right, remember we had something like this. All right, the next key thing is going to the magnitude. Notice I have delta V here in the numerator. Well, I also have delta V right here. So let's go ahead and use that fact. So delta V, I'm gonna get it all by itself, which means that if I bring the V on the other side, I have V over R, right? The speed divided by the radius. And I also have this change of R right here. Oh, well, now we're just about done. What I'm gonna do is now simply plug all of this into the equation for the magnitude of the acceleration, right? That is simply change of velocity over the change in time. And change of velocity I just found, right? It was V divided by R. These are just numbers, right? They're constants. And divided by delta R over delta T. All right, I still have the delta T that's left over from my definition of acceleration. So at the end, what you have to notice is that you have this right here, right? If I'm looking for the magnitude of the acceleration, well, now what you really want to do is you want to take the limit now when delta t, the amount of time, is very, very small, right? If delta t is very, very small, and imagine here you started out at my initial position right here. If delta t is small, that would mean that my final position, let me draw it in a different color here, my final position would be like right over here. This would be my RF, right? This is if delta t starts tending towards zero. In that case, you could see this delta R vector, the magnitude of it is very, very small. Okay. And at the end, well, delta R over delta T in this limit is simply going to be equal to the speed of the object, right? It's gonna be equal to the speed, the tangential speed, which is the same number as what we have right here. So at the end of the day, all you have is that the magnitude of this acceleration is going to be V multiplied by another V means you have V squared and divided by the radius of uh, the circle. And that's all there is to it, folks. Okay, there's nothing too complicated about that. Let's color that in. And that is the magnitude of our centripetal acceleration. All right, we're not quite done now. We also want to look at the direction of this velocity. So let's go back and show you how to do that. Let's think about the direction now. So what I've gone is I've kind of drawn my initial and my final velocity for my two times over here. And again, this was after a certain amount of time delta T has gone by. Uh, one thing to remember is that since both of these lengths of V initial and V final are the same, 
right? We have an isosceles triangle right here. And that means that both of these angles here have to be the same. Let's just call it angle alpha, for example, right? They have to be the same angle. Now, what we're interested in is really what is the direction of the instantaneous acceleration? So in that case, what you have to do is you really have to take the limit uh, when delta t here equals to zero. When delta t equals to zero, we should really redraw this triangle because what happens here? This is after a little bit of time delta t. I've started over here and I've gone all the way to the top. But if I end up going in the limit of small time, right? This is what you would have. You'd have my initial velocity, which is here. And my final velocity would be just like right over here, for example. It would be the same length, but the angle would kind of just be really, really small if I drew it, right? <laughs> it would look something like this. This would be V final. Well, remember, the delta V is right at the end over here. This would be the uh, vector delta V like this. And the angle in between them would still be my change in angle, delta theta. Okay. Now, if you think about what the angle alphas look like in this case, again, there's two of them. Their alpha is this one, and alpha is this one. And since you're looking at a triangle, we have to have that two times alpha plus this angle has to be equal to what? Always equal to 180 degrees when you add up those angles. But in the limit where we have delta t goes to zero, what you end up looking at is that this angle between both of those vectors, the initial velocity and the final velocity, has to tend towards zero. So if it tends towards zero, you can forget about it over here. And that means that both of these angle alphas, right? Each alpha in that case then has to be 180 divided by two, which gives me 90 degrees. All right, and why is this important? Think about the angle alpha. The angle alpha is the angle between this initial velocity and the delta V, All right? That means that the angle delta V is 90 degrees relative to the initial velocity. Well, here's my initial velocity. That means that the vector delta V has to point like this, delta V, right? It's 90 degrees, it's perpendicular to the velocity. Also, if I plot the velocity right here, that means that the vector delta V has to point like this instantaneously. Over here, the vector delta V has to point in this direction. Okay, it doesn't matter where you pick. And one thing we know is that the direction of delta V is also the direction of the acceleration. So at all these points, the direction of this acceleration, and we call it the centripetal acceleration, has to be toward the center of the circle. Okay, so let's go ahead and write that down. This is towards center. And it's also the same direction as the acceleration. Okay. So the acceleration has a magnitude a, which we just found is V squared over R. And the direction is always toward the center of the circle, regardless of where you are on this path. Here's the direction of the acceleration, always toward the center. All right, hopefully you understand the steps of that proof. All right, method two uses a little bit more calculus, but uh, it's still pretty straightforward. So uh, let me just draw a coordinate system here. And let's assume that at time zero, say I'm going to start right here on the x-axis. Uh, what I'm going to do now is I'm traveling at constant speed. So after a certain amount of time, I'm going to be located right here. And I've gone through a little bit of angle. Uh, I've got some change in theta here. And theta is defined relative to this x-axis. After a little bit more time, I may be all the way down over here. Okay, so let's consider the first position over here. So if you're going to draw this vector r, which describes the position, well, the vector r has an x-coordinate, right, which I can call this one over here. Well, having trouble with the line here, let's go. Uh, this here would be the uh, coordinate or the component of that vector Rx rather. And the vertical component uh, would be this one here, right? This would be the vertical component. Let's call this Ry. So one way I could describe this position vector, and again, at every time it's going to have a different position vector, but it would be whatever that component is, Rx, and multiplied by this unit vector that's along the x-axis plus ry, and again divided by, or sort of multiplied by unit vector along the y-axis. Now if I go a little bit further here, what you can do is you can express these components here in terms of the magnitude. Again, the magnitude of this vector r is always the radius of that circle. So I should be able to write this one as cos of this angle. 
and plus our sine of this angle, same angle. Um, J hat like this. All right, so this is my position R. Now, one thing I can do is that if I'm now going at constant speed, and that is always one of the assumptions that uh, we're making right here. So if the speed is constant, uh, guess what it means? It means that the angular velocity, right? The amount of angle that I trace out every single time is also going to be constant. So typically you can write this as an omega, and that simply means that the change of angle over the change in time is also going to be a constant value. Uh, this allows me to write my change in angle in terms of this value omega, my angular speed, multiplied by delta t. Uh, just to simplify the notation a little bit, uh, what I'm just gonna do is I'm just gonna call this uh, multiplied by time instead of having delta t here. Just keeps it nice and neat. Uh, now I go back and I rewrite my position vector and I'm almost done, believe it or not. So this is r cos of uh, omega t multiplied by this vector plus r sine of omega t multiplied by j hat. And then you could test this out a little bit, right? At time zero, uh, the second term is zero. And at time zero, my position is basically simply r right here. At some later time, I'm going to be located right up here. Uh, later on, I'm going to be over here and so forth. Anyway, this here will describe the position of this particle along this circular path. So if you wanted to take this one step further, you could say, well, what is the velocity, the instantaneous velocity of uh, this particle? Well, the definition of my instantaneous velocity, again, it's just simply differentiating the position uh, with respect to time. And I have a function of time here, so that means right away I should be able to write down what is uh, the velocity. So if I differentiate the cos, I get minus an omega will come out since I'm differentiating a a function of time like this, a sine of omega t, multiplied by i hat. And again, plus, uh, if I differentiate the sine, I'm going to get a cos, and the omega pops out, just using the chain rule over here. And this will be cos of omega t, uh, multiplied by j hat. Now, one thing you could do is, you could also check this out, right? At time zero, what do we have? For example, at time zero, does the velocity, does that work out? Well, what is the velocity? The velocity v at time zero, notice that this first term here will go to zero, so I won't have any uh, i component. And all I'm left with here is plus omega r, and cos of zero gives me one. So that's it, you're all done. So the magnitude or the velocity at time zero has this magnitude, omega r, and it's pointing in the j hat direction. And that's this one right here. This is the velocity here at time zero. Notice that it's pointing straight up. Uh, that's along the j hat direction. And the magnitude of this vector, at least at time zero, and you can prove that it's actually at any time, the magnitude is equal to this angular frequency multiplied by the radius. All right, so what we do want is we don't want the velocity. We're interested in now what is the acceleration. So in order to find the acceleration, let's go on the next page and take the derivative of the velocity because that's our definition. Again, if we're looking for acceleration here, acceleration, the definition is uh, just take the derivative of the instantaneous velocity relative to time. And what you end up getting here, if I differentiate the first function, sine of omega t, uh, I end up getting cos, and an omega is going to pop out by the chain rule. So I'm left with this, cos of omega t multiplied by i. And again, if I differentiate the second term here, uh, differentiate a cos, I'm going to get a sine, and another omega is going to pop out. Um, and derivative of cos is negative sine, right? So don't forget about that. All right, omega t, and then you still get the j hat vector. All right, so one thing we could find is, what if I'm just looking for the magnitude of these vectors? All right, what is the magnitude of r of t? All right, this one's easy, right? If you take the magnitude, well, you simply take um, <laughs> the square of each component, right? So here you'd have r squared cos of omega t squared and plus the square of the other component. Just use Pythagorean here, sine of omega t, and you don't forget to square this part. I notice that you have r squared for both of the terms. You could take that out, take that out of the square root. And at the end, the term in the square root is simply the square root of cos squared plus sine squared. And I know that equals to one. 
All right, so the magnitude of the radius vector, pretty straightforward, is simply equal to r. All right, just highlight that part. Uh, what if you wanted to know what is the magnitude of the velocity vector, right? The instantaneous velocity. Again, you can use the same argument, and what you're going to find here is that the magnitude of this vector is simply going to be equal to omega r. And we kind of already did that case, at least for one position. So let's go ahead and highlight this guy. All right, and the last one now would be what is the magnitude of acceleration? All right, again, if you find the magnitude of a vector, you have to square both terms and do the square root thing. And what you're going to end up finding here is that uh, the magnitude of my acceleration uh, is simply equal to uh, omega squared multiplied by r. And that looks different than the magnitude of the centripetal acceleration. However, if I combine it with this equation and I get rid of omega, now, what you're going to find here is you can also write it as v squared over r. And that's kind of straightforward thing to do. Okay, so right away we've shown that the magnitude of the acceleration is this v squared over r term. All right, that's a good thing done. The next thing we're interested in is what is the direction of uh, this vector over here? And one thing we notice here is that if you look at the vector a, let's look at both of these terms. Um, one thing I could factor out is a negative omega squared. And what are you left with? You're left with r cos theta multiplied by the i hat vector. And you're left with r sine theta multiplied by the j hat vector. That is exactly what the vector r is right here. So this is actually the same vector r that gives me my position. Now since I have a negative in the front of it, and this omega squared term is always positive, that means that regardless of where you write the vector r, the position of that particle, what you're going to find is that the direction of the acceleration is always opposite of that vector r. Right? That's why you have a negative sign here. So this is always opposite of this vector. So regardless of what your position vector is, if this is my position vector at some time, I'm going to find that the acceleration position is always toward the center of the circle. Right, R describes a vector that goes from the center to the edge. Uh, the vector A, at the end of the day, is a vector that goes toward the center, exactly in the opposite direction of that one. All right, hopefully you understand that proof. Uh, this is kind of using calculus because I'm taking the derivative of cosines and sine functions, but it's pretty straightforward. All right, thanks for watching, folks.